prayed in Psalms 119 so that we may behold wondrous things out of his word. I have to command that we praise the Lord for the choir despite the technical difficulty there. I think it worked, it worked well because the Nawalayan music background is mas lalang narinig yung inyong blending. See, so uh, and, uh, we're thankful for your ministry in preparing our hearts uh, for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. It's amazing. Brother James, can you please explain to us? Ano lo ba ba yung speaker? Okay. So, kasalanan pala ni Bluetooth eh, pala yung speaker. Okay. Alright, so let's turn the Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we're now in the third chapter of our series on 1 Thessalonians. I trust that you are learning from these passages of Scripture. We're now reading the entire chapter, 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 to 13. And to give God honor and due reverence, I'm asking all to please stand up as we read this portion of Scripture responsibly. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 to 13. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For many, many For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Now, now when the day is came for you unto us, we brought us good tidings of faith and charity, and that you have a remembrance of us always. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For, the, for what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? I today pray that you might see your face and my perfect love. Now God Himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you in peace from bound love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Verse 13 together. To the end we establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all of His saints. Let us pray. Our Father, we humbly come before Thee again, thanking You for salvation, full and free, made available through the, sex, through the substitutionary sacrifice of Your sinless Son. And thank You, Lord, for the opportunity as well and the privilege to serve You after being saved. And uh, we pray, therefore, that our sacrifice of worship be well-pleasing in Thy sight even during this worship service. Prepare our hearts as we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to deliver our souls. And we shall thank you for it. We shall pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> all right, since our beginning of our series, in case those of you who have not followed us through in our study of 1 Thessalonians, of course, those of you, can, you can always go back to our messages uh, both in Facebook or in YouTube in order to follow through the, our series from the first verse of chapter 1. We are now in chapter 3 and we've entitled this message, What Brings Real Joy Even Amid Affliction? So uh, this is a question that obviously is being answered in this passage. We already mentioned in previous messages that among the many churches in the, in the New Testament in the first century of one of those commendable churches that I'm sure you and I would like to be a member of if we were living in those days would be the church of Thessalonica. The Apostle mentioned that in the first chapter. They became followers of us and of the Lord and they became a pattern, an example 
to all that believe both in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth so that we need not to speak of anything. Wherever Paul went in his missionary journeys, planting the seed of the gospel, especially during the pioneering stages of the Christian church, Paul was kind of surprised that these people in, in, in Judea and in Macedonia and Achaia, they, Paul was thinking this will be the first time I'll be preaching the gospel to them, and then he finds out, Paul, we've heard that message already, and from whom? From the Thessalonians. What a blessing that is. They became a pattern, and that's why we're going to 1 Thessalonians, both the first and second epistles, because they are a pattern for churches today and for believers to follow. We do not want, there are some churches in, Thessal in the first century, like the church of Corinth. We do not want to pattern our church after that. They were a carnal bunch of believers. That is why 1st and 2nd Corinthians contain a a wealth of instruction and rebuke to these believers. Unlike in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, the church there. I mean, while they were not a perfect church. And by the way, there is no such thing as a perfect church. Only a perfect Bible and a perfect Savior that we bring sinners to. See, even the, the uh, exemplary church of Thessalonica uh, had their own flaws, their own fallibilities. So there are portions in this epistle where Paul had to correct some of their problems. Remember, a church which has no problems is a church that has no members. Okay? It does not exist. Okay? And even a church which has no members is a problem, isn't it? So what kind of a church is that? So what a blessing that despite the fallibilities of these first century believers in Thessalonica, they became a pattern for all that believe during the first century. And they continue to be a pattern for all believers in the 21st century to us. So it's, it will do us well to heed and pay attention how did this church grow? I mean, it's amazing how they began, remember? Paul went according to Acts chapter 17 to Thessalonica and he spent his, field, uh, his time there not with aimless pursuits. He went there and preached and engaged with the Jews in the synagogue for a period of barely two to three Sabbaths. And he was only there for two to three Sabbaths, virtually two to three weeks. But he had to leave the field, not for any other reason, but because the Jews were haunting the Apostle Paul. They were after his life. They wanted his neck. Apparently he was a Pharisee before he got converted to Christ. And when he got saved, he was on a fireball for the gospel. So that the very people whom he was, were his contemporaries in the Jewish religion, were now envious of his quote-unquote successes in Christian ministry. And apparently as he was preaching the gospel, in so doing he was also exposing the error of Judaism. And that, well, apparently that caught the ire of some of the Jews and they wanted to put Paul to silence. That's why Paul had to spend ministry only in, in, for only three weeks in Thessalonica. And therefore he had to move in order you know, for self-preservation. But nonetheless, despite the limited time that he had, Eventually, some sinners, in other words, the gospel was preached and therefore sinners got saved. It says not a few. And eventually, even in the absence of the Apostle Paul, a local church was established. What an amazing ministry. What a blessing. And I wish that, I mean, we could see that happening today. I mean, apparently it was not due to Paul's skill or brilliance or scholarship. It was a mighty work of the Spirit of God using His powerful quickening word to bring conviction and conversion to the field, to those in Thessalonica. They got saved, and therefore they congregated to become a local church minister. By the time Paul wrote First and Second Thessalonians, they had a degree of stability in that church already, and now Paul lays down some of the instructions that they needed to hear. And they were written, the Bible says, for us for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope now as we read through the third chapter of 1st Thessalonians I think and I believe that the key point 
or main idea of Paul in this chapter is this that the Christian is to bear the cross of Christ if he is to wear his crown again and again from the very first chapter all the way to the second chapter Paul mentions just as his ministry was he preached the gospel and sinners got saved but yet just like he as he would proclaim the gospel there was persecution that always haunted him wherever he went it was so true also with the Thessalonians despite opposition they believed the gospel they became persecuted and if it was so in the first century let us not be surprised if it will happen in the 21st century human nature does not change in time see the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked who can know it no one can know the depths of human depravity except God and yet nonetheless Here's Paul preaching the word of God and Paul had so much confidence in his message, in his material, and the power of the Holy Spirit so that it brought conviction and ultimate conversion. But Paul was driving up this point to these believers then. It's an important lesson we all need to learn today. Remember, the Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground. And therefore, the Christian is to be, if we are to bear the... Uh, uh, we, uh, we need to bear the cross of Christ if we are to wear His crown. This is not to earn salvation. Salvation is paid full and free. It doesn't mean it was not expensive. It doesn't mean it was not paid for. It required the blood of Jesus Christ to pay for our debt. But it is, it is free for those who would be recipients of it by simple childlike faith. That's as far as our salvation is concerned. That's as far as our justification before God is concerned. That's as far as our standing before God is concerned. But after being justified by faith through the merits of Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches that believers, though they're saved, guaranteed eternal life, <clears throat> will see God face to face in the, near, in the future on the day of glorification. If we are to get a crown, this is not about salvation, but if we are to receive a crown as believers, when we get to heaven, we have to be willing to bear the cross of Christ. No cross, no crown. We may enter heaven, but as the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we will be saved yet so as by fire. Have you ever wondered that phrase, what does that mean, 1 Corinthians 3? Saved, yet so as by fire. From the context, I think it believe, I believe Paul was saying that there are people, believers, who will be saved, whew, but so as by fire. In other words, uh, they got a D. You remember when you were in college and you were finishing your, perhaps your degree or your finals, and then you were wondering if you were going to pass your, you know, the course, and uh, your professor gave you a D. <laughs> Whew, passing grade. Mabuti na lang nakapasa. Some Christians will get to heaven with a, with a D mark. Saved yet so as by fire. Saved because of what Christ has done for them, but they do not enjoy the privilege of receiving a crown at the judgments. You know why? Because they were not willing to bear His cross. So this is the point Paul is driving at in this third chapter. I have a five-point outline in my message and let me give it to you point by point. First of all, we have Paul's flight. Point number two, Paul's partner. Point number three, Paul's purpose. Point number four, Paul's pleasure. And he closes this chapter with Paul's prayer. Paul's flight, Paul's partner, Paul's purpose, Paul's pleasure, and ultimately his prayer, Paul's prayer. So let's flesh this out one at a time. Verse 1, wherefore, remember in the last chapter, the chapter 2 in our message last week, Paul talked about the trials and the obstacles that he had to face. Sometimes it is difficult to be a witness for the gospel. Paul had to suffer for being a witness for Christ. And where did that suffering come from? It came from sinners. It came from his suffer from his uh, separation. He had the moments when he felt so all alone for standing for the Lord. 
It also came from Satan himself. For the Apostle Paul, as the Bible very clearly teaches, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. And let us not to be surprised, these very three you know, instruments will be used of the devil for us also to be, uh, to be, to be suffering for Christ. Because of ungodly sinners, because of being feeling a feeling of desolation or separation, and because of Satan himself. That should not surprise us at all. So now he opens up chapter 3, verse 1, with the word wherefore. In the light of the preceding chapter, the word wherefore is a connective. In other words, in the previous chapter, we saw the intense persecution the Apostle Paul and these disciples endured. Indicative of their love for God. Okay. What a blessing these saints were. We were talking about that partly in Sunday school. The believers of the first century loved the Lord so much as a result of God's love for them that they were willing to endure and suffer for Christ's sake. Where are those kinds of Christians today? Many Christians wilt in the slightest a discomfort that go our way. Pastor, I'm not going to church about it. And now we finally find a legitimate excuse. It's been two years and a half. COVID, but in Pastor. I mean, gas, gas, na talaga yung excuse na yan. I mean, it's understandable there are people who cannot make it in church because they're real. But there are people. Unlike the Thessalonian saints, they loved the Lord so much that there was nothing to hold. They did not allow anything. Of course, there were forces. There were obstacles. But they did not allow these obstacles to get in the way of their service for the Lord. So we saw that in the previous chapter, their intense persecution. And yet, despite all of that, they were faithful to Him. It was indicative of their love for the Lord. So we read again in verse 1, when we could no longer forbear. See, they were faced with so much pressure and obstacle. We thought it good to be left at Athens alone. That word forbear means to endure. Paul speaks of his anxiety becoming intolerable. Do you know anything of that suffering? He talked about being left, to be left alone. That word, to be left, is the Greek word katalepo, which means to be abandoned. The word is used in Ephesians 5.31 to refer to a man leaving his father and mother to be cleaving to his wife when he gets married. It is also used in Mark chapter 12, verse 19, of a dead man leaving his wife, a feeling of desolation. This is exactly what Paul felt as he proclaimed the gospel faithfully. You see, Paul was willing to consider it good to be forsaken. He said he was willing to be left alone, expressing a sense of desolation. Paul said goodbye to Timothy and faced the cultured philosophers and idolaters alone in Athens, although he knew that Timothy would have been a great help for his ministry. That's the price to pay for being a faithful Christian. There will be times that you will be called to stand alone. You say, I don't like that, Pastor. Nobody exactly wants that, and we should not be looking for that. But if we are going to be faithful in following the Lord, sometimes the Lord allows His saints to go through that. And when you go through that, may I remind you that the great saints of old the New Testament went through that, you are in good company. Meaning to say, when God allows you to be persecuted and take your stand alone from the approval of men, you and I enjoy the privilege of walking alone with God. What a privilege that is. Not very many Christians enjoy that privilege. But there are times God allows Christians to go through that. Even to the point of martyrdom. It was so in the first century. Let's not be surprised what will happen today. So there was a sense of desolation Paul went through. Because of being a faithful witness for the gospel. This was Paul's plight in the ministry of Thessalonica. And yet what do you see? What a church. 
an amazing ministry. Okay. So what was the mark of their of uh, you know of their quote unquote success? Beautiful buildings, carpeted floors, air conditioned auditoriums, that was not the mark of their of the success of this ministry. In fact to the contrary we see the world hostile to their message and therefore hostile <coughs> to their messenger. But they knew what it meant to walk with God and to walk alone. Do you know anything of that? That's Paul's flight, and let's not be surprised if we go through the same. Let's look at Paul's partner. So among, I mean, there were a few people, there were a number of people who did not like to be identified with Paul. Some of them were his colleagues even before in the Judaism, in the, in his, the religion of Judaism. Remember, he was a leader. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the strictest sect of Pharisees and of Judaism. And these were the very colleagues that turned their backs against him. But there were a handful of people during the first century who were not hesitant to be identified with the Apostle Paul. And one of them was a man whose name was Timothy. Paul's partner, verse 2. He said, and he, and we sent to Timotheus. You know what Timothy means? Timothy, do you know what your name means? <laughs> Timothy means what? It means honoring God. We sent somebody who is honoring God. That's what Timothy means. That's a nice name for a son, isn't it? Honoring God. And how did Paul call his partner? This was a spiritual giant, the Apostle Paul. He says in verse 2, We sent Timotheus. First of all, he's our brother. Paul did not hesitate to be identified with Timothy, and Timothy was not hesitant to be identified with Paul. There are people who are willing to be, who did not want to be identified with Christ while he was being beaten, when, while he was being crucified. The whole world was ostracizing Christ. And where were his disciples? Even his disciples deserted him, remember? Except for John, who was uh, beneath the cross, and some of the few women who were there, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. But most of them rejected him. Jesus said, if they rejected me, they will, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So there were people who were willing to be identified. Well, now, I'm not, I know some people who don't want to be identified with me for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's the same with you. But thankfully for men like the spiritual, spiritual caliber, like Paul, here was a man who was willing to be a partner in ministry. He is our brother, the Greek word Adelphos, meaning one of the same family. He was a spiritual brother in Christ. Remember 2 Timothy 1 5. Timothy was 2 Timothy 3 15. He heard the gospel while he was young. From a child, you have heard, you have known the gospel. Sabinia 2 Timothy 3.15. Timothy, from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures. So, Pagkabata pa ni Timothy exposed to the gospel. Where did Paul, rather, rather, where did Timothy hear the gospel? From his mother and his grandmother, Eunice and Lois. So this man was a privileged young man who grew up in a godly Christian family. Praise God for godly mothers and godly grandmothers or grand, godly parents. Some of us enjoy the privilege Timothy had. I did not have that privilege growing in a Christian home. Timothy enjoyed it. So he was exposed to the gospel. Now, by the way, let me make it clear. Not because you're a son or a child of a Christian father or mother that makes you a Christian. Salvation is not inheritable. What do we inherit? We do not inherit salvation. What do we inherit? We inherit sin. Yun ang ating namamana. That's why every sinner born, and every person born into this world is born a sinner by nature and by choice. And every sinner needs to come to a point in time in his life to put their trust in Christ as Savior. So don't glory in your Christian heritage. That doesn't make you a Christian. Timothy had to come to the point, 2 Timothy 1 5, Paul mentions that he was thankful for the faith that was unfeigned. It was not fake in him. 
which he heard from his grandmother Lois and his grandmother Eunice. Or was it Eunice and Lois? So here's a brother, Paul says. I know he's saved. Not only do I know his parents, his mother and grandmother, I know he's been exposed to the gospel, and I know that faith is in him also. I saw that evidence, Paul was saying. Second, he is what? He is God's minister. How would you like to be commended by Paul? Say, that man, Timothy, is God's minister. The Greek word for minister is diakonos. That's where we get the English deacon. Okay. Deacons are supposedly ministers. They are sa Tagalog, kaagapay ni Pastor. By the way, hindi kaaway ha, kaagapay ni Pastor. There has been some running joke in some churches that they call them the board of deacons because they become the board of demons. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I don't mean to hurt anybody in any other church. But sometimes some people think because I'm a member of the board, I am here to, what, to criticize the person. <coughs> Listen, they are fellow servants. And that word deacon, you know what that word means? The word deacon means it was, it was a word used to those of those who served tables. This does not sound like a board member, does it? They serve tables. Sila yung punas ng mesa, talagang servant's heart. What a blessing to have men and women in the ministry like Timothy. Third description of Paul's partner, not only is he a brother and a minister of God, he is a fellow laborer. And did you notice how the word Paul used that word? Fellow laborer. Paul, Timothy was a laborer, but he was a fellow laborer. In other words, he was a companion in the work. For Paul, he did not see any hierarchy. Ako, apostol ako, ikaw, assistant lang kita. Laborer ka lang. No, he was a fellow laborer. And you're hearing it from the inspired pen of the apostle Paul. A man of such high spiritual caliber, but he recognized the priesthood of all believers. And that every person in the ministry and church... Although some have been gifted more than others, we met Brother Aaron mentioned this early in Sunday school, some are four-cylinder Christians, some are eight-cylinder Christians, but we are four or eight-cylinder Christians not because of any merit of our own, it's all because of the grace of God. Our gifts are given by God sovereignly as He will. There's nothing for us to brag about and claim credit for it. And Paul himself saw that. He was a brilliant scholar. But when he was saved, he was saved by the grace of God. Listen, Paul wrote 13 New Testament epistles inspired by the Holy Spirit. It could have been easy for Paul to fall into the snare of pride. But how did he call Timothy? He was a fellow laborer. That speaks a lot of not only Timothy, it speaks a lot of the Apostle Paul. Listen, we are partners in this ministry. It's not my job. It is my calling, and it is our calling as a church to be a witness for the gospel in the city of Metro Manila. And wherever the Lord eventually opens doors for us, that's exactly where we are. We are working together with God to advance. Not my kingdom, that's the distinctive mark of a cult, a cult there after building their kingdom. Although they will say it's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But it's their kingdom that they're after. I'm referring obviously to some false teacher from the world. We're not after advancing our kingdom here. We're after advancing his kingdom. I hope that's the reason why you're here. Because that's what we're here for. And to get many people who are still under the kingdom of darkness, that they may see the light of the gospel through Christ and become part of the kingdom of light. That's what we're here for. A companion, Paul was a Timothy, was a brother, a minister, and a fellow laborer, as he says in verse 2. See, he was a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. And what was he there for? Paul's purpose. Notice verses 2b. All the way to verse 5. Why did Paul send Timothy? He mentions that in the next few verses. In it, verse 2, the latter part, 
so that he, Timothy, will establish you, comfort you concerning your faith. Uh, that's what the word establish is the Greek word so which means to set fast. It's translated fixed in Luke 16 verse 26. All of us are sinners by nature and by choice. When we hear the gospel and respond in faith from a life of dysfunctionality to a life of usability. How does that transition take place? First we become we become recipients of the miracle of the new birth. So regardless of how dysfunctional our past may be, maybe as a new Christian, we may be walking in the faith wobbly. But Paul sent Timothy so that these believers in Thessalonica would be established. Every young Christian needs to have, needs help of older Christians to establish these new converts in the faith. And that's what Timothy's ministry was. To set them fast. To establish second, to comfort. Parakaleo. It means to call near. More than to comfort. It carries the notion of strengthening, perhaps by exhortation or encouragement. Some Christians are wobbly in their faith and they need to be established. Some people are not growing as they should. Why? They have some burdens that they're wrestling with. They have some hurts, pain that they're going with. And they need what? They need comfort. They need somebody, a believer, to go alongside with them. That's what the Greek word parakaleo means. To call near or go alongside with. And that's Timothy's ministry. He was an exhorter. We need more Timothys in our ministry. Or in every ministry as a matter of fact. So that no man should be, verse 3, so that no man should be moved by these afflictions. That's another reason. That's the third reason. So that none be moved. That Greek word, sino. The word, the word was used to refer to a dog wagging his tail in order to allure, to fascinate, or to flatter, or to beguile, or to draw aside from the right path. And some Christians, because of persecution, because of problems, they eventually get sidetracked. They are moved. They're agitated. Maybe some of us are going through some problems right now, and is shaking our faith. But Paul sent Timothy to, so that they will not be moved. Timothy's mission was so that the Thessalonians would not apostatize or be persuaded by the smooth talk of false teachers while going through persecution and difficulties. The Bible keeps warning us again and again in all the New Testament epistles and even in the Old Testament that there are false teachers around and they will use smooth talk in order to allure you especially, they will come at a time when you're going through some tough trials. And when Christians are going through tough trials, maybe that person, that relative, that friend, that neighbor will tell you, and I have no problem. What church may not attend them? Foundation Baptist Church. Tito ko matin sa amin, masaya kami dito. But they're not teaching you to be grounded in the Word. Dito, pag, pag, pag ganyan, ganyan lang kami dito sa church na <laughs> It's like going to a party, you know. I mean, you you get carried away with the emotions, but after the after their service, you go back to reality. The problem is not gone. And you're not equipped to face these challenges. So that was Timothy's mission. So that these believers will be established, will be comforted, and so that they will not be move despite persecution and difficulties. Now how are you doing Christian? Maybe some of us are going through difficulties. We need to be established. We need to be comforted. We need not be moved. Maybe some of us are going through opposition and therefore the pressure is great to cave in to the temptation. You see uh, the minister, ministerial philosophy of many today 
is as long as people are getting saved that's all that matters but the Bible teaches it is not enough to have a spectacular conversion Christians must grow to be established and be strengthened in the faith something that is also even more pronounced today some churches so called I think it's a misnomer to call them churches <clears throat> but some churches exist so that they will make you feel good so that members will come and attend a church and they're looking for some motivational speaker the preacher or the pastor is not a motivational speaker <clears throat> when I tell you listen Christian <coughs> once you get saved just like the Thessalonians they were persecuted wow pastor that's really motivating <laughs> but that's what the text is saying there is a church here in Robinson's one of their slogans I think in their fourth floor I think somewhere their fifth floor I was surprised to see their slogan we are here to make God popular wow where is that in scripture to the contrary the things of God are detestable to the unsaved because the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God they are foolishness unto him because they are spiritually discerned 1 Corinthians 2 4 but that's the kind of ministries that people that you know people flock to. I mean, motivational speakers. When I attend, boy, the sarapanda naman ng pansat mensahe niya. They know how to tickle your ears, okay? but they never teach you how to get right with God and repent of your sin through the merits of Jesus Christ. So Paul reminded the Thessalonians. In that passage, notice in verse 3, For yourselves know that we are appointed thereto. To what? He says in verse 3, So that none of you be moved by these afflictions. Is it Paul naman? Poor persecution na pinag-usapan natin dito? Wala bang mas magandang pakinggan? Like this is the best day of your life? Something like that. Paul just declared the truth as it is. We're living in postmodern times, and postmodernism, <clears throat> uh, you know, that, you know, maybe you're not familiar. Postmodernism has been called postmodernism. You know why? There was a day uh, from the close of the ninth, uh, 19th century to the opening of the 20th century, modernism or rationalism became an enemy of the gospel. And what is that? Rationalism made reason the basis for right and wrong and therefore anything that was not a, that was not reasonable cannot be accepted as true this came from German rationalism Germany became the seedbed of rationalism it has to be reasonable in order to be accepted as true so when they they adopted that kind of thinking so when they op they opened the scriptures and they read the Bible you see the virgin birth how can a virgin not having known a man eventually give birth even conceive that's not reasonable so that can't happen you see the miracle of inspiration how can men write the Bible without committing an error that's not reasonable. So they deny the iner inerrancy of Scripture. How can men who are sinners by nature and by choice eventually transform to be children of God through the miracle of the new birth? That's not reasonable. It must be psychological. It's not supernatural. So that's rationalism. It's also called modernism. It so happened at the beginning of the 19th or the 20th century, eventually what happens? 1919 or so, there was World War One. People thought, we're no longer living under the dark ages. We are reasonable think thinkers. We believe in evolution. We believe we can now make airplanes and so on and so forth. And then World War One comes. 
ay, akala namin, pag matatalino na ang tao, wala na tayong gulo. And then, 1940s come, World War II, another World War, listen to that. I mean, I thought we we're all so brilliant people, we're all, we have now evolved into rational, rational beings. <clears throat> but the problem is they rejected divine revelation. After, after World War II, they say, therefore reason cannot be the solution to man's problem. That's modernism. So comes the phase of post-modernism. If reason is not the solution to man's problem, then what is our solution? It's not reason. So your reality, my reality, is now, it may be contradictory, but you're happy with your reality, I'm happy with my reality, let's be satisfied with that. That's postmodernism. No, there was no overarching basis for truth. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Now they talk about truths, plural, in spite of the fact they, these, their premises are self-contradictory. That's postmodernism. In other words, people make their own reality and live it out. For as long as it will make you feel good, that's all that matters. And by the way, young people, listen to this. We are living in a, in a time like this. Postmodernism is stronger than ever before. <coughs> so strong that some, some young people will say, hindi ako pwede pagalitan ng magulang ko because it's going to make, it's going to be toxic. I am losing my mental health. Listen, kapag pinagalitan ka ng magulang mo, of course your parents are not always right. But if your parents are arguing from the point of view of Scripture, if you're wrong, according to the Word of God, then you're wrong. You have to be willing to admit your fault and get right with God. <clears throat> you know, there is a, I think there is an article I saw at Google. You know, sometimes I update my hand myself with the news. And I saw in Google there was a, some high some celebrity and they're having a qual squabble with their father. Do you have to make all of that public? You know why we're living in a chaotic world? It's because we have departed from the Judeo-Christian values of the Bible. <clears throat> Gone were the days when people were saying, I remember talking to one man in New Jersey, Filipino, said me, Pastor, ang hipit ng lolo ko, gano'n ko lumaki. Sobrang hipit na talaga. Hindi pwedeng magkunting gulo pag gagalitan ako. But you know, Pastor, look at my house. Kaya maayos yan, I am thankful that my grandfather disciplined me. Praise the Lord. No, but today, young people say, ah, I'm always being disciplined. This is too much. This is child abuse. Excuse me. I am not discrediting that possibility, but we have to make sure. We are living in an entitlement mentality culture. We forget that everything that we enjoy is all by the grace of God. But anyway, let's move on. So Paul says, we were appointed thereunto. Affliction is not an accident. It was a necessary part of the Christian's life. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Acts 14, 22, Jesus, God reminded Paul of the same thing. He was there to be persuaded. We are living in this life, and this world is not our home. The symbol of Christianity is what? It is the cross. It's not the feather bed. Affliction is just a is part of following Jesus Christ. And therefore Paul recognized that Christians are appointed to affliction. Pastor, I never heard this kind of a man. I would hear that in another preacher's house or a preacher's another church. And then the other church was to do kasi dun talaga. I'll make you know you're here to live a life to the fullest. 
but that's not what the Bible says. The Christian's faith will be tested. And Paul knew this. And as a good pastor, he did not hesitate to warn the Thessalonians of this. Notice in verse 4. So he says in verse 4, For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass, and you know. It's happening to you. This is exactly what we told you. And verse 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means... Again, Paul recognizes the presence of the devil. The tempter may have tempted you and our labor eventually might, might become in vain. Who is the tempter? Obviously, this is referring to Satan. Paul was expressing fear that his labor among these saints might have ended in vain. He knew that Satan has many methods of seducing people from the truth to exploit the season of suffering. And as in the case of Job, Satan wanted to tempt the Thessalonians to give up on God. Among his many methods to allure believers from the truth, who are the instruments that the devil or the tempter uses to get the Christians to get sidetracked? Perhaps former pagan or unbelievers, pagan friends. Maybe some of your former friends who are not saved will kind of bumalik na lang tayo. Tandaan mo, meron tayong pinagsamahan. Siyempre, iba naman yung mayroong pinagsamahan. Naging human, di ba? Yan ang pinagsamahan natin, santo pa. San? Yeah. Or another avenue, Satan, is the craftiness of false teachers. Or the severity of suffering. All of these are methods to allure Christians from being faithful to God. And although the unbelieving Jews were the immediate cause of persecution, Paul recognized that Satan is the great author of persecution. In the time of persecution and trial of any kind, Satan usually tempts us to swerve from the truth. And I'm preaching to you, so I'm preaching to myself. How important it is that we are established in the truth of the Word of God. In times of adversity, Satan often tempts the sufferer to murmur and to, co to complain, to charge God with harshness or partiality. Bakit sila naghihirap? Ako naghihirap, sila hindi. Or of severity and to give vent to expressions that will show that Christianity has none of its boasted power to support the soul in the day of trial. In all times of affliction as well as in prosperity, we may be sure that the tempter is not afar off and should be on our guard against his, we should be on our guard against his wiles. Turn with me very quickly to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. Here's what God's Word says. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath, hath promised to them that love him. And let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. See, 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 Jos. Why? Because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Sometimes the devil doesn't even have to, to bother us. We are tempted because we are drawn away by our own sinful nature. And then for enticed. And then when we when lust has lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's why James says in verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. <clears throat> Another passage in 1 Peter 5, 6 to 11, but we don't have time. So let's go to our last two points. Paul's pleasure, verses 6 through 9. See, he says, But now, when Timothy, Timotheus came from you to us, Timothy had some delightful news. He brought us good tidings. The Greek word for good tidings here is the Greek word for good news. 
euangelizo. This is the only portion in the New Testament where the same Greek word is used to refer to, I mean, that word is used to refer to the gospel. It is only in this New Testament passage that the same Greek word is being used here. Just as the gospel of salvation, that's great news. So it is when the Timothy's report was brought to our ears, it was the same impact. This is good news indeed. This is the only place in the New Testament where this word is used of any good news. Always the word is used in reference to God's saving work in Christ. Therefore it shows how Paul was remarkably affected by Timothy's news. It was all about how the Christians in Thessalonica were growing in their faith in their charity and in good remembrance of them. The Thessalonians remained orthodox in their doctrine, in their faith. The Thessalonians were impeccable in their conduct. They were growing in their love. And the Thessalonians, in other words, Paul had good remembrance of them. Paul had nothing but fond memories of them. And the Thessalonians too yearned for a reunion. Timothy also brought the good news that the Thessalonians had not believed the, vic the vicious and false rumors <coughs> of Paul. So Timothy's news resulted in Paul being comforted amid affliction. That word affliction means pressure, anguish, or trouble. Amid affliction and distress. The word distress is used of outward calamities or distresses. So that, that good news to the Apostle Paul was just like the gospel. And that is why he said, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord, verse 9, for what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God night and day. So as we look at the last few verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, notice Paul's prayer. Night and day we are praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. That's still Paul's prayer. His longing to be reunited and that the Lord make you to increase. So they were growing but Paul says that you would increase and abound even more in love toward one another, toward all men, as we do toward you. So that at the end, you may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So Paul invokes the august majesty and unique power of the Almighty God, the Creator, and to direct the con control of the events. He was praying for a reunion and a restoration. And that God would perfect or repair, that's what the word means. That would perfect them or repair them, whatever er areas in their lives that they need to grow. That word perfect, that our teacher is the same word used in Galatians 6.1. What does the verse say? <clears throat> if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are, which are spiritual, restore. Katartizo. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. To repair. It means to be restored, to be prepared, to be framed as it is used in other passages. That's Paul's prayer. We all need restoration. It's all possible through Christ. First, verse, verse 12, Paul's prayer, a growth in their love. That they will grow even more. And that should be our prayer for each other. And verse 13, that they will be strong and established in their testimony. To be prepared to stand blameless in holiness before God as a judge and searcher of the inward motives of men who tests and tries our hearts. That's how, what, how we should be praying for <coughs> That we would all grow in maturity, grow in our love, be established in the faith, regardless of the trials and afflictions and adversities we face. 
innocent person. So let me ask Christian, how are we growing? You know what brought joy to the Apostle Paul amid the affliction? Is the news that these Thessalonians were walking in the truth. John put it appropriately. Sabi ni John, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in the truth. <clears throat> We've said this before. That's exactly what John the Baptist said, and it's exactly true. There really is no greater joy than to see your children, whether that be your blood children or your spiritual children, your friends of the Lord. No greater joy than to see your children walk in the truth. It really does. No greater joy. And I want to close by simply saying this. By the way, I'm so thankful for all of you who gave gifts for me last week. And that was a real thrill. But there is no greater joy than to see you walk in the truth. Walang tutong basta. That's exactly what the Bible says. So let's learn to grow more in thee. Our Father in Heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for first century Christianity, recorded and preserved in the sacred pages of the Bible. The kind of Christianity that is so lacking that we need to see in 21st century. With all the fakes around them, that's my prayer for myself, my family, for every one of us. May we reflect 21st, in the 21st century, this first century Christianity that is taught by Paul, reflected among the Thessalonian saints. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around before we close. Pastor, pray for me. God spoke to my heart. <coughs> I have trusted in Christ as my Savior. And perhaps some of us are going through trials or adversity. Maybe even persecution. And you're tempted somehow to cave in. That temptation comes from the tempter, the devil. It makes no sense for you to yield. The Word of God tells us that Paul used Timothy to establish, strengthen, and settle these saints in the Word. You don't have to be carried away. None of these things should move you. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be steadfast and stable for the Lord, regardless of what Satan places in my way. Regardless of the obstacles, I want to stay true and faithful to Him because He has been faithful to me. That's my prayer. I hope it's yours too. Would you raise your hand? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Others more. Pray for me, Pastor. God spoke to me. I, I understand what you're saying, Pastor. This world is not a playground for the Christian. It's a battleground. And in spite of that, I want to be a faithful witness for the gospel. To, to rejoice in the Lord for the joy of the Lord is my strength in spite of the obstacles that come my I want to just be true to Him until He comes is that your prayer? anybody else? yes sir yes sir yes ma'am yes sir yes sir others more finally pastor pray for me I'm, I'm not even sure if I'm saved and I wish I had that assurance that Paul was speaking of to these Thessalonian saints We'd be happy to show that with an open Bible to you. Show you how to be saved and get right with God <coughs> through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Don't be hesitate. Don't, don't, don't be hesitant. Okay, may yeah. We'd be happy to help you. Pray for me, Pastor. I want to know what it means to be sure of my salvation. Would you raise your hand before we close? Would you? Our Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of these saints in Thessalonica. May we see such authenticity of Christianity manifested today in the hearts of your people through the God and Holy Spirit. Let it be seen in us. I pray for myself, together with these who raise their hands. Help us to reflect Christianity, biblical Christianity in our lives. Not being swerved, not being sidetracked by the devil, but simply being true by your name and grace to the you in Jesus' name.